Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back for your coffee break. I'm going to take about five minutes of, oh, let, let me just check with you all. If I kind of do this with a microphone, is anybody having any problem hearing me? Raise your hand if you are. Okay. Anybody having any problem hearing me? Raise your hand if you are. Boy, that's the difference between three quarters of an inch away and a quarter of an inch away. This is a sensitive instrument. All right. I want to take about five minutes of my time this morning to find out something about you as an audience. And um, I want to do a quick denominational check-in. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's do this. All right, I'm back. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to ask you what denomination you're from. I realize that it's possible that some of you may not be from any denomination, but raise your hand when appropriate. And uh, let me start off, since we're in a UCC church, how many of you are UCC? Oh, okay. Um... 30%, I'm going to guess, okay? How many of you are Presbyterian? Uh, About 15 of you, mostly to my left, which pleases me. How many of you are Episcopalian? Okay, I'm going to say again, okay, up on the balcony too, about 20 of us. Let's see, Methodists, many Methodists here. Okay, about uh, a dozen. Um, Roman Catholic. Okay. uh, My goodness. (laughs) Do you always get applauded wherever you go? (laughs) About eight of you. How about Baptists? Okay, about ten. Uh, Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church. Okay, uh, about eight of you also. Quakers? Really? Okay, there's a, there's a Quaker over there. All right, all right. Um, and let's see, Unitarian Universalists. Uh, about ten of you. And, um, all right, I haven't asked about Swedenborgians in a long time. How many Swedenborgians here? Really? Okay. Oh, really? Okay, about at least four of you. I'm Swedish and I'm a Borg, but I'm not Swedenborg. Okay, okay. And uh, I never make a list, so I may have forgotten to ask about... Oh, Reformed Church of America. Okay, a couple of you there. Uh, Any denomination I haven't mentioned you want to call out? What? Lutheran? Lutheran. All right. Half a hand for Lutherans. Uh, About eight and a half of us. Okay. And anybody else? Okay. Uh, MCC, Metropolitan Community Church. Okay. Um, Interdenominational, non-denominational. A couple of you, three of you. Um, Pentecostals. Yeah, yeah, I know. When there are, I just tell them to wave their hands. Right, 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 right. Anybody else? Religions other than Christianity. Okay, okay. That's probably uh, enough. Um, Let me mention to you in advance, I have never before given a lecture in my life holding a microphone. I normally use both hands to gesture and so forth, so this will be a new experience for me. Uh, I hope I don't get carpal tunnel from this or something, okay? Um, But I'll try to be good about keeping it close to my mouth. 
And I want to make the transition to my talk this morning with a brief prayer. And this prayer is from St. Augustine or St. Augustine. You can say his name either way. And because it's a relatively brief prayer, I'm going to read it twice. I think prayers are oftentimes like poetry. We sometimes hear them better the second time through. So we go back to around the year 400, some 16 centuries back in time. O oh God, from whom to be turned is to fall, to whom to be turned is to rise, and in whom to stand is to abide forever. Grant us in all our duties thy help, in all our perplexities thy guidance, in all our dangers thy protection, and in all our sorrows thy peace. And once again, O oh God, from whom to be turned is to fall, to whom to be turned is to rise, and in whom to stand is to abide forever. Grant us in all our duties thy help, in all our perplexities thy guidance, in all our dangers, thy protection, and in all our sorrows, thy peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our body and our blood, our life and our nourishment. Amen. I want to start my talk today by telling you about a church that has recently introduced four services on Sunday morning to respond to the different kinds of groups we have in our time. The first service every Sunday morning is for new Christians, for those who have recently found their faith. The second service each Sunday morning is for those who have been in the church a long time and are basically happy with the way things are. And the third service is for those who feel that they're in danger of losing their faith because they're besieged by doubts. And the fourth service is for those who have been wounded by their Christian upbringing and they want to gather for lamentation. And the names of the four services are finders, keepers, losers, weepers. <clears throat> the church of the future. <laughs> Let me begin by linking what I'm going to say today with um, what I did last night, and then I'll tell you the title of my lecture this morning. Last night, I described a major change underway in American Christianity today, a change that is most visible in the old mainline denominations, though also in a stream of evangelical Christianity, namely the emergence of a new way of being Christian. And in my talk today, I'm going to focus on what I think a church of the emerging paradigm, a church of neo-traditional or progressive Christianity might look like. And if you like your lectures to have titles, the title of my lecture could be called, in real shorthand, From Convention to Intention, or only slightly longer, but saying the same thing, From Conventional Christianity to Intentional Christianity. And I begin with a prologue in which I comment about the title, From Convention to Intention. 
And my title, this phrase, seeks to name a major and continuing development within mainline denominations over the past 40 years. We are moving from a conventional form of Christianity to a much more intentional form of Christianity. And by this change from conventional Christianity to intentional Christianity, I mean two things. First, I mean a movement from convention to intention as the motive for being Christian. Until about the mid-1960s, there was a cultural expectation in most regions of this country that people would be part of a church. In the small town in the upper Midwest in which I grew up, when I think of my elementary school class, probably about 30 kids in the class, I think if I had asked any one of them, what are you, meaning denominationally, religiously, every one of them would have had an answer. I don't know if anybody in the town in which I grew up, admittedly a town of only 1,400 people, I don't know if anybody would have said, oh, I don't go in for that kind of thing. There was a cultural expectation that everybody would be something. And so long as this expectation remained in place, mainline denominations did quite well. They offered a culturally respectable way of being Christian, and nobody would ask you to do anything too weird if you became part of a mainline church. And so the conventional Christianity of a generation or two ago meant, in part, everybody was part of something. In the 1960s, this cultural expectation began to disappear, and this development is sometimes called the end of Christendom, that is, the end of the wedding between Christianity and dominant culture that lasted for a millennium or more in Christian lands. One of, this, one of the things this means for the future is that soon, very soon really, people who are Christian because they became Christian for conventional reasons will no longer be around. Um, we'll all be dead. And the only people left in mainline congregations are people who have joined them with intentionality, who will be intentional Christians. Right now, of course, we're living in that transitional place where mainline denominations are made up of people who became Christian for reasons of convention and people who are much more intentional. There is also a second meaning in that phrase, from convention to intention, namely, from a form of Christianity accommodated to convention and culture to a form of Christianity that challenges cultural convention. Again, to say something that you all know, Christianity historically has commonly endorsed or at least accepted the conventions of the cultures in which it has been the dominant religion. This process began when Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, and ever since, Christianity has commonly endorsed systems of domination. I'm not going to demonstrate that for you. I simply invite you to think of Christian Europe throughout the Middle Ages and until the democratic revolutions of the last two centuries or so. Christianity legitimated that very hierarchical social order, oppressive economically, oppressive politically, and so forth. That's the wedding of Christianity with domination systems. Or to use examples from our own history and closer to our own time, when cultural convention accepted slavery, Christians commonly accepted slavery. 
when cultural convention accepted segregation, Christians commonly accepted segregation. When cultural convention was patriarchal and sexist, Christians commonly were as well. When convention was, and to some extent still is, heterosexist or heteronormativity, so also Christians have been that. And when cultural convention has promoted uncritical patriotism, Christians have commonly been uncritically patriotic, and you could add to that list very easily. We might call this the cultural captivity of the church, or in our own time, even the imperial captivity of the church. Now, this is changing. This wedding of Christianity to convention, both as the motive for being Christian and as uh, Christianity as the endorser of culture. And this brings my prologue to an end, and so I turn now to the main body of my talk. The way forward, churches of the emerging paradigm. And what I'm planning to talk about is what this might look like at the congregational level. And here I'm struck by a kind of irony, uh, Brian and Diana know far more about what's happening in the lives of individual congregations than I do because my bent is biblical scholarship and theology, and here I'm the one talking about what this would look like at the level of congregational life. In a sentence, congregations that take the emerging vision of the Christian life seriously would be, and are, communities of transformation. And this follows directly from intentionality as the motive for being Christian. Christians who are Christians for intentional reasons are intrinsically interested in transformation. And so I'm going to talk about communities of transformation under, and here I have to look at my notes, how many points do I have? Four. Okay, four main points. All right. That's what happens when you prepare your lecture four days in advance. You can't remember what you're going to talk about. Okay. <clears throat> so, all of this under communities of transformation. First, communities of adult Christian theological re-education. Adult Christian theological re-education. This is a crucial need in the mainline denominations today for at least two reasons. First, for adults who are already Christian. And the reason why re-education is needed for most of these people is because of what I spoke about last night and what I have written about in several of my books. Namely, an earlier understanding of Christianity that was very common as recently as a generation or two ago has become unpersuasive to millions of people in our time. And if Christianity as a system of thought and a set of practices is to make persuasive and compelling sense to adult Christians in our time, we need re-education about all of that. Indeed, and perhaps I'm prejudiced because I'm an educator, I think this is one of the most important tasks for the revitalization of the church in our time. There's a second reason why adult theological education is a crucial need. Namely, for new Christians coming into the church as adults. We talk a lot about the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings. And at least in some parts of the country, the majority of 20-somethings and 30-somethings have basically grown up outside of the church. 
I am acutely aware of this in Oregon, which is the least churched part of the country. Roughly 25% of the population has some connection to a religious group, and that means basically Christian group in Oregon. 75% of my students have had no contact with the church except maybe going to a wedding or a funeral, or when they go back to the Midwest to visit their grandparents in the summertime, sometimes they get taken to church. As a result, they have no acquaintance with the Bible or Christian language or whatever, except whatever they might pick up from Christian radio or Christian television or billboards. Okay? Now, as those people, as adults, come into the church, they need Christian education. We cannot assume, as we could a generation or two ago, that everybody has grown up in Sunday school with the Bible stories and so forth. Uh, by the way, a quick aside, I mentioned Oregon is the least church state in the country. When I first got there in 1979, I made an allusion to casting pearls before swine to my introductory class, and the students looked around at each other, and I realized they did not recognize the metaphor at all, and they felt insulted. <laughs> Is he calling us pigs? Yeah, basic point. Uh, we cannot assume that the next generation has any significant acquaintance with the Christian tradition. Now, this adult theological re-education needs to be about the big topics. And I name some of these just to illustrate. I'm not trying to be comprehensive, so if I leave out something important, cut me a little slack. I'm illustrating, okay? But Christian theological re-education about the big topics, such as the word God, what we mean by the word God. And here I comment that the most common meaning of the word God in Western culture is that the word God refers to a person like super powerful authority figure out there who relates to the world through intervention. In shorthand, this is the God of supernatural theism. This is the God, of course, that is the target of the current best-selling atheist critiques of religion, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and uh, Christopher Hitchens. And for many people, that's what the word God means. And they either reject the notion of God because it makes no sense to them, or they struggle to believe in that notion of God because they think they're supposed to. And for those folks, the realization that there is a very different understanding of the meaning of the word God in the biblical and Christian tradition matters greatly. And this other understanding of God is God as the encompassing spirit in whom we live and move and have our being. And that notion of God, equally as ancient as the God of supernatural theism, is not vulnerable to the atheist critique in the same way. Or a second topic, the Bible. Christian adult education needs to deal with the content of the Bible, yes, but equally importantly with questions like the origin and authority of the Bible, its interpretation and its meaning. Biblical literacy means more than the ability simply to read the words of the Bible or knowing the stories. It means having some idea how to interpret them and what they mean and so forth. And again, I say the obvious conflict about the Bible is probably the single biggest source of conflict in the, in the church in North America today. And that conflict is really about two very different understandings of its origin, authority, and interpretation. And the most common understanding of the Bible amongst those outside of the church is 
the understanding that they pick up from Christian radio, Christian television, and so forth. And we need to work hard to make people aware that there is this very different understanding out there. And one of the problems with what we used to call liberal Protestantism, what we now might call progressive Protestantism, is that we have oftentimes been far more clear about what we don't believe than about what we do affirm. And as a result, we have commonly allowed our conservative brothers and sisters to have a near monopoly on the Bible and, for that matter, traditional Christian language. Re-education about the figure of Jesus. Uh, I think common understandings of Jesus typically focus on his death as a necessary sacrifice for the sins of the world and therefore commonly do not emphasize the importance of his life and message. I think also common understandings of Jesus typically under, uh, underline his divine identity and so forth, that he was really God, even though he looked like one of us. And I think re-education about Jesus can make him a persuasive and compelling figure. We need re-education about prayer. Richard Rohr, whose name many of you will recognize, contemporary Franciscan monk and priest and author, um, once said that the church that does not teach its people how to pray has virtually lost its reason for existence. And my final example of the topics of Christian theological re-education would include the Christian life itself. What's it about? And I'm not going to try to answer that question for you. I'm just going to say that's a really important question. What's the Christian life about? How does Christian theological re-education happen? Well, through the obvious means, obviously through adult education classes in a parish, but that's not the only way to do it. Reading groups are an extraordinarily valuable way to do it. Reading groups do not require expert leadership. You simply need somebody who knows how to facilitate discussion without dominating it, but you don't need a theologically trained expert, somebody who has been to divinity school, for example, to lead a reading group. You need a commitment from people in the reading group to read a chapter or two or whatever the assignment is for each session and do it. And people will feel very free to disagree with an author who's not in the room. Whereas if Somebody in the congregation, whether clergy or laity, takes it upon themselves to exposit an alternative way of seeing. Some people might uh, be silent even though they disagree because they don't want to offend anybody. But as I've already said, people feel very free to disagree with an author who's not in the room. And then, of course, another vehicle for re-education in parish settings is video series, and the series that I hear the most about is the Living the Questions series. And Living the Questions now has not only the basic 12-session introduction, but a couple of follow-on courses available as well. And I have never heard a negative comment about the Living the Questions series from people who have been involved in it. A second feature of a congregation that took uh, being a community of transformation seriously, namely, they would be communities of Christian formation. Let me move into this by commenting briefly about the relationship between education and formation. They're not identical. Now, I think it's very difficult to do Christian formation without education, but education 
by itself, even theological education, is not intrinsically formative. And so when I speak of Christian formation, I'm thinking of, you could call it, Christian re-socialization. To be a Christian in our time is basically to be re-socialized. We've all been socialized in Western culture, uh, most of us in an American form of Western culture, and the vision and central values of the biblical and Christian tradition are very different from that. Formation is basically a process of re-socialization, and so, for example, we might have spiritual, theological, experiential formation groups in parishes, spiritual journey groups, and so forth. And this leads directly to the third feature of such communities. They would be communities of practice. And for now, I'm going to include worship under practice. So you could say communities of worship and practice, but understanding worship as one of the practices. And this would need to include education about the purpose of practice. Is the purpose of practice because God expects us of it? It's one of those requirements, okay? Or, as I would argue, is the purpose of practice opening us up to God and centering us more deeply in God? In short, practice is about forming us. And this would include teaching individual practices, perhaps the value of a daily discipline and what that might look like. And probably the single most important individual practice is prayer. Prayer, not so much as asking for things, though I'm not against intercessory prayer, but I see the primary purpose of prayer as being paying attention to our relationship with God. Once you begin to think of the Christian life as being about a relationship with God, then it follows that though God may be beyond, may be, may be the mystery beyond all words, a relationship with God in some ways is analogous to a human relationship. It grows, it deepens to the extent that you pay attention to it, that you spend time in it. And prayer in all of its forms is a way of paying attention to our relationship with God. So also with worship as practice. Let me move into this by um, telling you a brief story. A couple of years ago, I was driving oh, maybe two hours back to Portland late at night after giving a lecture somewhere close enough so I could get home the same night. And when I'm driving late at night, I oftentimes will listen to Christian radio because it helps to keep the blood up. Okay? And, and I always look for a preacher or a Bible study teacher. I don't want Christian music um, popular Christian music at that time of night. And sure enough, I came across this preacher, a guy, of course, and he was talking about worship and why we worship God. And his explanation as to why we worship God went like this. God just loves to be worshipped. God just loves to be praised, and that's why we worship God. And I sat there thinking to myself, oh my God, this makes God sound like, you know, the ultimate primary narcissist. It's like, oh, that feels good. I just love it when people praise me and so forth. Now, that would be worship as something we do because God expects it of us. 
Well, my understanding of worship is that worship is of God, of course, but it's really for us. Not of us, don't misunderstand, but it's for us. In the following senses, the purpose of worship as practice is to draw us out of ourselves. And maybe the other side of that same coin is that it draws us out of ourselves and it opens us up. Now, if we think of one of the purposes of worship being that, it to some extent would affect how we design our worship services. It would affect our choice of music for congregational singing, for example. The purpose of congregational singing is to draw us out of ourselves, open us up, and unite us in a community of praise. And that won't happen if the music chosen is too difficult for an ordinary, untrained, musical person to sing. <laughs> Choir can do the most difficult stuff it's capable of. Okay. And if the purpose of worship is to open us up and draw us out of ourselves, it would probably, we would probably cut down, cut back on the domination of our worship services by the spoken word. The spoken, non-poetic word is probably the least effective way of opening us up. Now, that doesn't mean sermons should go. Sermons are vitally important, and I'll say something about them in a moment. But if you combine the domination of a typical liberal Protestant worship service by the spoken word with the absolute need to get everything done within an hour, so the spoken word comes at you pretty fast as well, it's not, worship is not going to be serving its purposes. Okay? For liturgical churches, there are some advantages. One of the reasons I love being an Episcopalian where the words are basically the same every Sunday, I don't have to pay attention to them with my head. Now, I'm not trying to make a case for being Anglican. I'm just telling you how that kind of service works, okay? I can lose myself in the sound of the congregation saying these familiar words together. But if every word in the service is freshly composed for that Sunday and somebody has worked hard on it, then there's almost an obligation to pay attention with your head. And we are not typically transformed through our heads. Now, you know, I'm an intellectual. I don't simply devalue the head, but I don't see it as the primary entry for our transformation. Third purpose of Christian worship, besides opening us up and drawing us out of ourselves, is Christian formation. Formation through hearing the words of Scripture, Formation through the sermon, formation through participating in the liturgy. And finally, I can't resist mentioning a fourth function of worship, which I owe to Walter Brueggemann, whose name I think you all recognize. Brueggemann speaks of the purpose of worship as subversion. He speaks of doxology, by which he means the praise of God as a prof profoundly subversive activity. If God is the source of all blessings, praise God from whom all blessings flow, then no earthly Lord is the source of all blessing. If God is Lord, then the lords and rulers of this world are not. And if we could recover a sense of Sunday morning worship as a profoundly subversive activity, I mean, think of it. Instead of Christianity as the legitimator of conventional mores, as the legitimator of patriotism, as the legitimator of economic systems and so forth, the Christian message proclaims God alone 
as known in Jesus is Lord. The lords of this world are not. And this leads to the fourth feature of local congregations as communities of transformation. Namely, communities of participation in God's passion for the world. Let me repeat that phrase, not because it's such a magnificent phrase, but because it might be a bit unfamiliar. Communities of participation in God's passion for the world. Let me begin by mentioning that I puzzled about how to name this one. This is essentially a political dimension of the life of a local congregation. This is the local congregation as an agent of the kingdom of God, if you will. And here I'm picking up on the language of Jesus as well as Brian. (laughs) (laughs) The life of Brian, I'm sure that's been said to you many times. Okay. Um, And, you know, I and many others have written about this in many places, so this is probably familiar to you. But let me just say the obvious. Kingdom of God is not only central to the message of Jesus, but it is a political metaphor in the first century. And that's because kingdom was the most common form of political and economic organization in that world. There was the kingdom of Herod. Rome did not refer to itself as an empire. Rome referred to itself as the kingdom of Rome. And so when the hearers of Jesus heard him speaking about the kingdom of God, they would have said to themselves, we know about the kingdom of Herod and we know about the kingdom of Rome. Kingdom of God must be something different. And of course, as the Lord's Prayer itself puts it, the kingdom of God is for the earth. You know, somehow we have oftentimes domesticated the kingdom of God either by not emphasizing it at all or by equating it with heaven, with the next world, in part because Matthew has changed the phrase kingdom of God to kingdom of heaven. But even in Matthew, it's clear that the kingdom of God is for the earth. Think of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, John Dominic Crossan again has a great one-liner about this. Heaven's in great shape. Earth is where the problems are. And the kingdom of God is for the earth. Now, to relate that to the phrase participation in God's passion for the world, I've kind of fallen in love lately with the phrase, the passion of God. Not meaning the suffering of God, though I have no objection to speaking of God participating in our suffering and so forth, but passion in the sense of what we mean when we ask of somebody, what's your passion in life? What are you passionate about? And suppose we ask that question about the God of the Bible. What is God passionate about? And what the God of the Bible is passionate about is the world. (laughs) For God so loved the world. And what kind of world? Well, the non-human world, the world of creation, yes. And that's important and also the world as the way the world is structured by human beings, namely a world of justice, meaning economic justice primarily. That's the primary meaning of justice in the Bible. Justice in the Bible is not really about punitive justice. It's about economic justice. God is passionate about a world of justice and peace, and that's basically what the kingdom of God is about. So, 
they would be communities of participation in God's passion for the world, God's passion for the kingdom of God, for the passion of Jesus as the kingdom of God. What was Jesus passionate about? The kingdom of God, once again. What would this look like at the level of a congregation? It means that they would become communities of consciousness raising. So this is still, at this point, somewhat of an educational task, though consciousness raising is about more than simply education, as those of you who may be 30 years ago or more went through feminist consciousness raising or whatever. Consciousness raising is about systems and how they impact the lives of people. In our time, I think one could make a good case that the greatest source of unnecessary suffering in the United States today is oppressive economic systems. Racism is still with us. Sexism is still with us. Heteronormativity, of course, is still with us. But the United States is the most difficult country in the developed world in which to be in the bottom 40% or so of the population. Now, we need to help our congregations see how systems, in this case, economic systems, impact the lives of people. One of the reasons for that is that the United States is the most individualistic country in the world, which means that most people tend to think individualistically, and they tend to think of the economic uh, outcome in people's lives as most commonly the result of industry and discipline and seeing your opportunity and taking it. So we need to do consciousness raising about how systems impact people's lives and then consciousness raising about the political passion of the Bible itself, the political passion of Jesus, uh, the political passion of God in the Jewish Bible and is known in Jesus. And this also means consciousness raising about the Bible's teaching about war and nonviolence and peace. Uh, for example, and here I risk getting into a political harangue, I know, and I'm not trying to convert you all. I think you're all on the same page, basically, as I am. Um, but just, just how much work there is to do within the church is the real point of what I'm about to say. The United States is the most Christian country in the world in terms of the percentage of our population identifying themselves as Christians. Roughly 80% of Americans, when asked for their religious affiliation, will say Christian. And in terms of absolute numbers, roughly 240 million Americans will say they're Christians. That's more than in any other country in the world. And at the same time, Christians in this country seem almost oblivious to the history of Christian teaching about war and peace. You know, the only two legitimate Christian positions on war are pacifism, the first 300 years, which means a commitment to nonviolence, or just war theory. And just war theory absolutely prohibits starting a war. There's more to just war theory than that, but it absolutely rules out preemptive war. A war may only be a war of self-defense, and it must be a last resort, and so forth. And yet, the demographic group in our country giving the highest percentage of support to starting the war against Iraq, in the months before March of 2003, was white evangelicals. 
84% of white evangelicals favored preemptive war against Iraq. Now, one of the things that indica indicates is an extraordinary failure of Christian education. How is it that we could have a born-again president who apparently had never heard of such a thing? And how is it that 84% of the Christians who probably would consider themselves among the most devout Christians in this country had never heard of such a thing? This is part of what I mean when I say we need to do consciousness raising both about systems and also about God's passion for justice and peace. And then beyond consciousness raising, but still under communities of participation in God's passion for the world, these transforming communities need to become, will become, communities active in the world for compassion, justice, and nonviolence. I turn to my concluding comments. In some ways, I've described what I would see as an ideal congregation. But there are congregations like this. And I'm also not suggesting that any congregation wanting to become a transforming congregation needs to start doing all four of these things at once. And I also want to acknowledge that there are some congregations where trying to do this may not be a good idea. What I have in mind with this very last statement is my realization that there are some small congregations that basically will not survive no matter what is done. Might be because of demographics, a rural area where the population is declining. Uh, might be because um, the congregation uh, is made up primarily of people over 70. I have nothing against people over 70. I'm soon there myself. But the point is, unlikely that those kinds of congregations will suddenly at start attracting 20-somethings and 30-somethings and have a future. And if you happen to be a pastor or a member of a congregation like that, it could be that the pastoral responsibility is somewhat like being um, a chaplain in a retirement center. And that's not a put down, that's a very vital task. So I'm not trying to suggest a universal recipe here by speaking of transforming communities. But for congregations that do have a future, I'm convinced that this is the way forward. This is the market niche, if you will of mainline denominations in particular, and of anybody else who wants to undertake it. But this is the vocation of the mainline denominations as I see it. And sometimes I have heard people within mainline denominations talk about how conservative churches seem to be growing, and if we want to grow, we need to become more conservative. And I simply want to say, for mainline congregations or denominations to become more conservative is simply to deny the vocation that we have been given. Let the conservative denominations <laughs> fill that vocation if it is indeed a vocation. But for us to move that direction would be to abandon our very reason for existence. And so I conclude by saying, we are called to be communities of participation in God's passion. And God's passion is actually very simple. It's twofold. The first, God's passion is that we center more deeply in God. Not because God is the ultimate narcissist, but because this is the path of human liberation. This is the path of reconnection to what is. This is what is meant by the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. We yearn for that, I am convinced. 
I think Augustine was right when he said, our hearts are restless until they find their home in you. And the second part of God's passion is that we change the world. Uh, I return to that most familiar Bible verse from the New Testament, for God so loved the world. It's not just that God loves me or God loves you or God loves you and me or God loves Christians or God loves people, but for God so loved the world. The world is God's passion. And to participate in God's passion calls us to this deep centering in God and this task of transforming the world. And these are the two transformations at the center of the Christian life. One personal, one political, and we are called to be communities of transformation. Thank you very much.